Welcome, Renew Church. Today we are continuing our series of Paul's Pro Tips, which is the urgent advice that Paul is handing down to Timothy from first and second letters of Timothy. And Pastor Merrick is talking about the pro tip today of seeking God's approval. We have uh, a number of upcoming events. First, we are excited that on March 1st, just a few days away, a couple of days away, uh, COVID restrictions are lifting. It's very exciting. Um, barring any changes in Peel region, um, it looks like we will continue to do self-screening, of course. Come to church if you're well. Uh, we will be wearing masks, but there's no more capacity restrictions, no more seating restrictions. So you can sit where you like, sit with your friends. You don't need to register before you attend. Just come and enjoy church and come and fellowship in person. It'll be great to see you out. Look forward to seeing you in person next week. Also, ah, congratulations and a thank you to everyone who was involved last night with Coldest Night of the Year. This was a charity walk that a number of youth and members of our church participated in in Milton last night. And uh, we raised thousands of dollars, far more than our original goal, to support Milton Transitional Housing. So thank you for that. Maverick Youth, speaking of them, also exciting because restrictions have lifted. We are back in person at St. Jude's on Tuesdays, effective this Tuesday, March the 1st. So uh, if you're coming out this afternoon to service, there is Maverick Youth today in person at church this Sunday afternoon. Uh, but today, Sunday, is the last one in church. And from now on, it will go back to Tuesday evenings at St. Jude's for Maverick Youth to convene. Also, we have uh, two classes um, starting up. One is this Thursday, That Man Called Jesus. This is 7 to 9 p.m. on Zoom out of convenience factor for schedules and geographic locations. This is a fantastic class. It's six weeks long, uh, really book club, a book study style on the book of John, the gospel from the New Testament. And if you, uh, in any situation, if you're newer to the church, if you're newer to learning about what Jesus is about, if you, if you don't have the book of John memorized, this is good for everyone. So please uh, check out on the Church Center app you can see in the list of events that that class is starting up. This is not a class that you can join late, so please uh, fill in the registration form right away so we can get you included for that class. Now, are you in grades three, four, or five? Or are you a parent of a child in grades three, four, or five? We have a very interesting opportunity for you guys that I don't think we've ever done before. We've heard about um, people in this age group asking about baptism and a stepping stone to baptism is actually the class that man called Jesus. So we are looking at putting that class together instead of Sunday school. So a six week series at church on Sundays. So please reach out to me directly because depending on your travel schedules for March break, we might start that after March break. Reach out to me if you're grades three, four or five. And if you're somebody who is like really serious about reading the book of John, studying about the life of Jesus and taking that journey. A quick reminder for Renew Group leaders, we are having a Zoom meeting tonight at 8. The Zoom link should have been pushed to you as a notification through the Church Center app and emailed to you. Or reach out to me, denise at renewchurch.ca. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in, in thanks. We are so thankful that uh, restrictions are lifting, that... Um, you know, things are, are safer in the world and we can come and gather together more. You know, you designed us in your image as relational beings and you've told us not to neglect meeting together. So we're so looking forward to more opportunities of doing that, Lord. Lord, we come to you with uh, hopeful expectancy. Lord, we just, we lift the Ukraine up to you. Please be with 
the political leaders that are involved, that should be involved, should not be involved, just to bring peace, Lord. Please be with the people of the Ukraine as they're going through such turmoil. And be with, be with the church in the Ukraine, Lord. Um, just have your, your overwhelming peace fill people that they know your love, that they can be sustained through you, Lord. Uh, Lord, we also lift up um, our own church leaders. Um, Pastor Bartley is at a, a conference this weekend meeting with uh, fellow uh, pastors and leaders. And Lord, he's been asking for your wisdom and clarity and guidance on future visions for our own church. So please be with him and, uh, and unveil that to him, Lord, of how we can continue coming closer to you, loving you, loving our neighbor, and um, making more disciples and working for your kingdom. Lord, please be with us today as we learn uh, not to focus on what the world thinks, but to focus on what you think and your approval as we hear Pastor Merrick's message. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, guys. Welcome to the scripture part of our service here. Let me just read from Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 to 10 before we jump into our sermon. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom glory be forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting of the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please the people? If I were still trying to please the people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Good morning. My name is Merrick Kowalski, and I'm the Communications Director here at Renew Church. It's good to be with you this morning to carry on our series, Paul's Pro Tips. Uh, for those of you who know me, many of you are probably aware that I recently lost my mom to ALS this past January. Uh, prior to this, she was a very healthy, active 76-year-old, but the disease just came and progressed very, very quickly. Uh, she began experiencing some muscle weakness, and there were some tests run in August that revealed that ALS was quite likely. And then in October, the doctors uh, confirmed that diagnosis. But then by November and December, she had lost a lot of mobility, was experiencing uh, trouble swallowing and speaking. And then on New Year's Day, she was taken to the hospital because she was struggling to eat and passed away in the hospital just four days later. So I just first want to acknowledge that and thank all of you for your prayers over the past few months. It meant a lot to me and my family. But I also wanted to share a little something that came out of the, the course of coping with the shock of this loss. There's this one memory that just seems to keep surfacing for me above the others that gives me a lot of encouragement. It was the summer of 2020, my niece was supposed to get married, but COVID upended all of her plans. And so with the wedding venues and the reception venues closed, she decided to have a more intimate ceremony in the backyard of my sister's house. Also, without anyone to officiate, she asked if I would do it. Now, I had never done this before, and, and I was honored to be asked, and I was certainly willing to give it a try. So. That summer, the restrictions opened up and we were able to have about 50 people in my sister's backyard and everything went really beautifully. It was awesome. And uh, when the ceremony ended, you know, I'm up at the front and the bride and groom walk down the aisle and everyone just because we're in the backyard starts milling about with some food and, and drinks. And I'm there just kind of packing up my notes and I, I look up and I see my mom come, coming against the flow of people weaving around. And she just came right up to me and, and threw a big hug around me. And, and you should know this is not typical of my family. We're not frequent huggers, but she embraced me and she just told me how much she loved what I had done that day for my niece. Now I'm sharing this with you today because I've actually been a little surprised myself to just discover how much my mom's approval in that moment meant to me and how much it continues to mean as this lasting impression of her and my relationship with her. And so in the context of today's message, it really got me thinking, if a parent's approval can have such a powerful impact then how much more does God's approval mean? Our tip of the day for this week, for week eight, is to seek God's approval. Now, as we talk on this topic today, I'm going to share some other sub-tips, some, some pro tips and advice that Paul shares in 2 Timothy chapter 2, but I, I just want you to keep this phrase in mind, because I think a lot of what Paul downloads to Timothy in this chapter really points back to this one idea. So, if you take anything away from today's message, it, it should be this, the importance of seeking God's approval. Now, as you dive into the chap this chapter, I think you can, you can really see the wisdom of Paul here in the things he chooses to share with Timothy. You know, Paul's here sitting in a prison cell. He's writing out what would be his final letter. 
And Paul knew that Timothy was going to be tempted by things, tempted to seek the approval of others or to pursue his own desires, his own ambitions, maybe even to make a name for himself. And I think a lot of that you know, comes uh, part and parcel with the job Timothy is being called to as a leader being raised up in the church. But part of that is also just the sin nature that we all have in common. You know, we're, we're all tempted to measure our lives by different metrics outside of, of God, right? Whether that's our own happiness, success and achievement, or gaining the approval of others. You know, even more than all that, though, I think what we might be seeing here in this chapter is also Paul speaking to Timothy from this very personal, deep-lived experience. You know, think about it. Here's Paul. He's, again, sitting in this jail cell. He's under arrest. Uh, his ministry is pretty much brought to an end. He's probably, in fact, facing the end of his life, and he knows it. And he's reflecting on things, and he's writing out, you know, words to his successor, this young man, Timothy, words that he thinks he needs to know in order to carry on the work. And so I imagine Paul probably thought back over the course of his life, all the way back, all the way back to the days he spent as a, a Pharisee. Now, if you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus had a big problem with the Pharisees, and it was the very problem we're talking about today, the problem of approval. Look at what it says in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 3 to 7. Jesus speaking says, They do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is for the approval is done for approval for, excuse me, everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. So do you kind of see what's being said there? They cared more about the approval of people than the approval of God. It was all about keeping up outward appearances and then receiving respect and admiration from other people and enjoying the perks of the job as, as being leaders. Meanwhile, through all that, though, they failed to live out a genuine faith and have a real relationship with God, their Lord and Father. Jesus you know, often said they were missing the heart of things. Back in his first letter to Timothy that we looked at earlier in our series, Paul confessed that he was guilty of being one of these men and doing these, th these things. Just as a reminder, look at Timothy 1. He says this, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a tr trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. So all that kind of background to say that I think the words we're about to read from Paul today have tremendous weight, the weight of someone who has learned the hard lesson of what it is to live for others' approval instead of God's. I think he's giving Timothy and us the benefit of a very difficult experience and a very heartfelt word of warning to be careful in this topic. So let's dig into the second chapter of 2 Timothy. Uh, when you open up this chapter in your Bible, you'll see that it's divided under two main headings. Now, keep in mind, these headings are not written by Paul. They're added later. Uh, and different translations, you'll actually notice, have very different headings in this chapter. For example, in the NIV, the, the first piece is called The Appeal Renewed. In the ESV, it's A Good Soldier of Jesus Christ. Then the second section in the NIV is Dealing with False Teachers. And in the ESV, it's A Worker Approved by God. So some discrepancies, some differences there in how different translators decided to kind of write those headings. But aside from that, aside from those differences, I think those divisions are really helpful in orienting us to what we're reading because Paul does seem to have two big ideas at play in these two sections. So I would kind of suggest that the first section here is really all about perspective. You know, it's about our identity. It's getting us right in the way we think about ourselves, about our lives, our relationship to God. In other words, it's the why behind why we ought to seek God's approval. Then the sec second section here, I think, is really about practical matters, how we live it out and put it into practice, what we ought to do, or the how that we go about pursuing God's approval. So let's dive into this first section on perspective. And the first thing Paul does is he gives us some helpful word pictures. So I'm going to hit you with our first pro tip right here, and that is to think like a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And we'll read from second, uh, the second chapter of 2 Timothy here to understand what these mean. So we'll put it up on the screen here. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. So Paul begins by uh, encouraging Timothy to be strong in the grace of Jesus and, and then exhorts him to teach others who can also teach. In other words, to keep passing down the things Paul passed on to him. But he also repeats something we heard last week. Join with me in suffering. So let's just stop and take note of that. Twice already in this letter, Paul has told Timothy to join with me in suffering. These are the words from a guy locked away in a prison cell writing to a free man on the outside. So let's just let that think that sink in for a minute, because I think, you know, we probably tend to neglect verses like these. If you're like me, you, you read the word suffering and you want to just keep on reading. Let's skim past it. Let's get to the next verse that talks about grace and blessings, because, you know, suffering is not what I'm looking for. It's not what I open up my Bible to see. Let's be honest. This is a very off-putting piece of advice to accept. So maybe that's why Paul then creates this series of character sketches to help us approach it with a better perspective, this idea of suffering. So he illustrates three uh, identities or, or personas through which to understand suffering and sacrifice. And I think in each of these, we can also see different aspects of what it means to seek God's approval. So let's begin with this idea of the soldier. That's the first image he gives. It's a very you know, clear, personal, uh, a picture of personal sacrifice. He explains that the soldier separates himself from civilian affairs. Now that might sound like a loss of freedom to us, but look at it as that you know, noble and selfless calling to give your life for a greater purpose, to sacrifice for a cause bigger than yourself. Paul says that instead of being concerned with everyday civilian stuff, the soldier focuses on pleasing his commanding officer. Now again, that sounds like a loss to us, a loss of independence, of autonomy. But imagine that commander as the one who leads the fight to save others, a commander who cares for every soldier in his regiment, who would leave no one behind, who would take a bullet for you. And of course, that commander is Jesus who in fact did take a bullet for you, so to speak. So instead of being caught up in the mundane, everyday stuff that most people waste their time, their energy, their lives on, you as the soldier seek to please the commanding officer who also protects you and leads you in this amazing mission. So if you were to take Paul's advice and you were to think like a soldier, you might ask yourself something like this. Am I fighting to save anyone but myself? Am I fighting for anything of value, for anything of higher purpose or mission? Am I looking to Jesus to lead my fight, uh, or that fight, that bigger fight, as my commander? You know, am I striving for his approval? Paul then switches to the metaphor of an athlete. Of course, an athlete makes a lot of sacrifice as well. They, they train, they work hard, eat, breathe, and live their sport, right? And Paul talks uh, at the end of this uh, little section that, that there's, at the end of all that, there's the victor's crown that they pursue. You know, if you read between the lines, obviously you'll realize that God is the one who uh, is, is the one to award that crown, who commends you for that race well run. But on the flip side, Paul's image of the athlete actually serves us as a bit of a warning because he says the athlete doesn't receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. God has established the rules of the sport. He determines how it's won. And if you try to take shortcuts to cheat, to break the rules, well, what happens? you're disqualified. It's the opposite of approval. It's failure. It's shame. It's disgrace. No one wants to be a Tanya Harding or a Ben Johnson, right? So if you were to think like the athlete, there's a few questions you'd ask yourself in that camp. You'd say, you know, am I committed to God's playbook? Am I willing to do this right, to commit to the hard work and discipline it takes to play by the rules, compete fairly, and chase that victor's crown? Am I even competing, or am I just a spectator? And if I'm in this, am I serious about reaching the podium, about achieving that victor's crown? And then the last persona that Paul presents is that of a farmer. Now, right away, you see farmer, you probably think about the hard work, the patience, the perseverance a farmer needs. Maybe you think about his dependence on God for the right growing conditions, you know, protection from harmful weather and pests. But interestingly, what Paul focuses on here in these verses is that the farmer should be the first to receive a share of his crops. Why? You know, what does that have to do with these broader themes of seeking God's approval? 
Well, Paul has often said things like this, that those you know, who devote their whole lives to ministry deserve to be taken care of. So there's certainly that at play here, especially as he's talking to Timothy, a future leader, or, or even a current uprising leader. But I think for many of us, there's also a lesson here on finding our fulfillment and our enjoyment in God's work. So put yourself in the mindset of a farmer and ask yourself this, does the work of God fill me up? Where do I find my joy? Is it the work God has for me? Because if not, then maybe that's something I need to probe into and work on. Okay, so all that flowed out of join and suffering. You know, sacrifice like a soldier, compete like an athlete, work hard like a farmer. And this is all tough stuff. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So what Paul does next is he provides Timothy and us with a little reminder. So his next pro tip is to remember Jesus. Pretty simple, but we need that reminder constantly. Because when Paul says, join with me in suffering, then he also needs to tell us to remember Jesus. He's the reason we suffer. Let's take a look at what he says next in the chapter. He says, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You know, no one voluntarily uh, enters into suffering with a powerful motivation. A soldier doesn't give up that civilian life without a good reason why. The athlete doesn't compete without a goal. And the farmer doesn't endure back-breaking labor in the fields without hope of a harvest. So Paul reminds us that Jesus is our reason for everything. He reminds us who he is, that he's raised from the dead, meaning he's fully God, and that he descended from David, meaning he's also fully man. And as we respond to who Jesus is, you can see how these three identities we just talked about uh, come into play. Like the soldier, we suffer and sacrifice to save others because that's what Jesus did for us. Like the athlete, we work towards the prize, salvation in Jesus, eternal glory. And like the farmer, we endure clinging to the hope of these things as the fruits of our labor. Paul then records what is probably an early Christian hymn. It presents four if statements, each with a corresponding conclusion. The first two are positive, the second two are negative. Here it is in verses 11 to 13. He says, here's a trustworthy say, worthy saying, if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So that hymn concludes this first half of the chapter. Again, the focus on, was on getting perspective, uh, an understanding of our identity, coming to grips with the motivation and the attitude we need to seek God's approval. And so as we move into the second half of the chapter, we're going to see the how. This is, again, sort of the practical implications of all this. And to do this, Paul now presents us with three more things, three contrasts in the church. And I believe that each of these represents a conscious choice that we have to actively make between one option and another. And so here they are. They are true or false, special or common, kind or quarrelsome. So let's start with the first, true or false. And we're going to read from verses 14 to 19. He says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value, and it only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Now, verse 15 in the middle there is where we get our theme for today, our tip of the week. Do your best to present yourself to, one, to God as one approved. Paul explains that the, the person who receives God, God's approval is firstly, you know, someone who doesn't need to be ashamed. So think back to that athlete persona. And secondly, as someone who correctly handles the truth. I read an interesting article this week from the New York Times. It's, it's based on the study and commentary of Michael Cofield. He's a digital literacy expert at Washington State University, Vancouver. He's been examining the effects of our information age, misinformation in particular, and here's a little quote from him. He says, we're taught that in order to protect ourselves from bad information, we need to deeply engage with the stuff that 
washes up in front of us. So he suggests that the, the dominant mode of media literacy we're taught is that you'll get imperfect information and then use your reasoning to fix that somehow. But in reality, that strategy can completely backfire. Interesting. Many people have said that you know, this digital age has brought on an information crisis, but Mr. Cofield ar argues that it's actually an attention crisis. Here's something else he says. He says, the goal of disinformation is to capture attention. And our natural human mindset is a liability in an attention economy. It allows grifters, conspiracy theorists, trolls, and savvy attention hijackers to take advantage of us and steal our focus. Whenever you give your attention to a bad actor, you allow them to steal your attention away from better treatments of an issue and give them the opportunity to, to warp your perspective. You know, I think Paul was ahead of his time. Either that or this attention problem has been around a lot longer than the internet. It's probably a little bit of both. You know, in the verses we just read, Paul says a few things that sound very close in principle to what Michael Cofield was arguing in this article. Cofield says you know, that we're at risk of allowing our attention to be stolen away from better, more valuable perspectives. And Paul tells Timothy that quarreling about words has no value and it actually ruins those who listen. Cofield says that giving our attention to what he calls a bad actor can warp our perspective. And Paul says that godless chatter can do that too, making us even more ungodly. You know, we live in this weird world where misinformation spreads easily. It's fed by social media and search engine algorithms. But it looks like 2,000 years ago, Paul was warning that false teaching spreads just as easily. He calls it spreading like gangrene. The original Greek there is, is a, a sore that eats into the flesh. But you know, the really concerning thing I was thinking about is what Paul is talking about. It's not happening in social media, on blogs, and YouTube, or even news outlets. What Paul was talking about was happening right in the church. He mentioned two men who had turned away from core doctrine to believe and teach new ideas about the resurrection. They were saying that it wasn't physical, that it only took place in a, a spiritual sense. It kind of degrades what Jesus had done. And then Paul says that their teaching is actually destroying the faith of others. You know, with all of our history of the church and biblical scholarship and all this media available to us, this is not a problem that's gone away. There will always be people who claim to have some new perspective or a better understanding or a more nuanced interpretation of scripture. And we have to be aware that these things aren't always good, healthy, or true. That's why lately you've heard us emphasize this at Renew Church, the need to be cautious about the teaching, the media, and the commentary that we all consume. So here's some advice, another pro tip. Maintain a steady course in your understanding of truth. In those verses, Paul said, the one approved is one who correctly handles the truth. That phrase in the original Greek writing, that correctly handles, it's actually suggesting a plowman who makes a straight furrow in the soil. You know, I recognize that understanding the Bible can be a very difficult endeavor. You know, it's confusing, it's messy, there are issues of language and translation, there's cultural influences that come into play, uh, there's unfamiliar literary forms like, you know, prophecy and, and, and poetry and just things lost to history. But as we're weeding through this and we're reading on our own, I just want to caution you, when in doubt, be careful where you turn to for your answers. Sometimes the best approach, often probably the best approach, is just to take a, take a step back, look at the text, and look for a clear, straightforward answer and, and understanding of the words as you read them. Try to focus on the primary concerns of God in his word and try to avoid the unnecessary rabbit trails. And remain committed to God's word. Guard your attention. Back to that article, Michael Cofield, you know, he advised that internet users need to learn that our attention is a scarce commodity that is to be spent wisely. I think you could replace internet users in that statement with followers of Jesus. We need to be careful with our attention. Or, you know, actually to, to pull from Paul's words to Timothy, you could also say, you know what? Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Remember that straight plow line. All right, let's take a look at the second contrast shown here in the church. That's between special or common. And we get that from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. He says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. 
I actually really love this image. It jumped out at me when I read it. The house in, in it is the church, and then inside are these articles or vessels, right? Uh, they could be utensils or implements or you know, cups or glasses like I've shown here. Some are reserved for special purposes, and then some made of clay and wood are for more common use. Now, there are two possible interpretations for the common articles. These could be the false teachers, which would be consistent with how Paul uh, uses that term also in his letter to the Romans. Or the common may simply be those in the body of the church who are more suited for you know, our more menial tasks. Now, regardless of which interpretation you lean toward on this, I think you can see the action Paul is calling us to in this, this, these verses. It's, it's kind of the same thing. He's encouraging us to prepare ourselves to be the ones used for special purposes. So our pro tip out of this is don't settle for the common. Paul is suggesting that those who cleanse themselves and make themselves holy or set themselves apart in some way have a higher level experience. They're to be useful to God and God prepares them to do any good work, he says. You know, I think that's what I actually felt uh, officiating at my niece's wedding. Because of the path I've taken in life, I found myself in this place and position to be asked and then given this honor to serve my family in a, in a really, really special way. And because of that, I got to experience this very impactful moment of my mom's approval that I still carry with me as, as a lasting memory of her. And I'm sure God's approval was in that moment as well. You know, we don't need to wait for heaven to receive God's approval. We can experience it here and now by preparing ourselves to be used by him in special, in uncommon ways. And maybe, you know, one of the ways we prepare ourselves in this comes down to this last choice or this last contrast in the church Paul gives us, and that's between kindness and quarrelsome. So let's read these last few verses in the chapter. He says, Flee the evil desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Notice the choice Paul asks Timothy to make. It connects with and, and sort of builds on what we've said about holding to the truth and guarding our attention. He says, flee the evil desires of youth. In other words, avoid distraction and in, instead choose that, that straight course. Pursue love, faith, righteousness, peace. Then he repeats his instructions about quarrels again. We saw that a little bit earlier. He says, you know, don't get into these stupid arguments because they're only going to get you into trouble. But then Paul presents a new reason to avoid quarrels and arguments. And he's appealing to Timothy's role as a teacher. He says, you need to gently instruct your opponents so that they'll come to repentance and knowledge of the truth. In other words, your job isn't just to prove them wrong, but it's to show them what's right. You're to help them, not beat them down or turn them further against you. You know, as followers of Jesus, we all teach and instruct in some way, in the way we live our lives, in how we uphold our Christian values, and how we share our faith. So here's our last pro tip. Try winning them over instead of winning the argument. You know, it's difficult to stand for our values as the world gets increasingly post-Christian. You know, it's going to be even harder for us to stay committed to the truth when there's a lot of opposition. We're going to run more and more against the grain of our culture. We may have to be bold, maybe bolder than we'd like, and that might make us frustrated, afraid, disappointed, even angry. So what Paul tells Timothy here is a good reminder also for us. A, rem a reminder that we're not fighting for our own survival. Remember, we're soldiers under the command of Jesus, enlisted to save others. And Paul reminds us we're not going to succeed by fighting against them. Instead, we need to fight for them. He says our job is to save them from the trap of the devil, as he put it, who has taken them captive to do his will. Right? That's a, a powerful calling. Now, none of this is really easy teaching in this chapter. There's a lot of difficult stuff, so I want to emphasize something as we close. Just remember that we don't need to earn God's approval, but I do think it's helpful that Paul here is prompting us to seek God's approval. 
We're all saved by grace, and it is a gift that, that we didn't earn. But sometimes it is a gift that we take for granted, a gift that we can become complacent in. And so we need a push, like Paul gives us in this chapter, to do the hard things, to not get sidetracked by meaningless talk and arguments or by you know, just settling for the common and the ordinary. We need to walk unashamed and correctly handle the word of truth, as he said earlier in the chapter. And we need to honestly ask, would God approve of my thinking, my decisions, and my actions right now? I think that question right there is the basis of confession, of humility, of understanding our sin nature and appreciating that gift of God's grace and the immense sacrifice of Jesus. So I want to paint a little picture for you, and it's influenced by a parable we read last week. That was the parable of the talents. And in that story, Jesus, you know, he creates this contrasting picture of servants who serve their master well versus one who disappoints him. And last week, we focused more on the disobedient servant. But today, I want you to think about those obedient ones. Do you remember what the master said to them when they dealt well with what he had given them? He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, can you imagine at the end of your life arriving in heaven to hear the God of the universe in front of you in all his magnificence and glory speak those words to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I just think that's an amazing and powerful motivator. I hope you join us again next week when Elder Barry Jones is going to be with us to share the pro tip, pace yourself. And until then, I would encourage you and pray that you would seek God's approval in new ways this week. We'll see you then.
Hey guys, welcome to the post service. I am here this morning with a familiar face, maybe familiar, maybe Ooh. not to some people who are newer to Renew Church. This is Catherine. Hello. Catherine was <laughs> one of our GCBI students last year. Yes. And now, tell us what you're doing. Tell us what you're up to. Also, um, what are you doing here right now? Well, I'm here visiting for reading break and I'm in school, so I'm sending a University of Victoria on Vancouver Island, NBC. I'm studying kinesiology. Um, so yeah, that's been super fun. Definitely different than GCBI, but I've been enjoying it a lot. So Cool. Yeah. So you do actually do more than just playing violin? I do, yes. Are you still practicing the violin a lot? No, <laughs> oh. I'm not. Oh, Don't tell my mother, but... <laughs> well, she might well, watch she, she already knows. Oh. But yeah, no, I, I've been taking a break from it. I mean, I've played violin like every day for 15 years. Okay. So it's been nice to take a break, you know, find some other things that I'm interested in. And uh, yeah, I mean, also I'm busy with school, so. That's, yeah, yeah, that's fair. How long is your program? My program is four years. And then um, I don't know what I'm going to do after. I might do a master's degree. Wow. My okay. make people call me master. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> do people even do that when someone gets a master's know. degree? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, you could, but I don't know, I don't know if it would stick, you know? Might be kind of awkward, yeah. to be honest, but... Yeah. No, so, I don't know. We're just going with the flow, see what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And how has your time been here? How does it feel to be back in the office right now and not playing violin? Because I feel I like pretty much every time you came to the office, you played violin, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Usually I wasn't talking very much. I was just like playing or singing or doing something, not talking. So it's different. And the office looks, the set is different too, because I think you guys redid it. Oh after, yeah, we, we did redo it in finished, the summer. So it looks really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you're, welcome. you're welcome. The visit's been really nice. We, um, I got to see a lot of old friends, people from, we visited May and Kevin, had to at the Just Bass, um, went bowling. Both this guy were not actually that great at bowling, so that's true. I've decided to not quit not, my day job. Yeah. So yes. you're stuck with me. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately, <laughs> wow, thank you. Um you got to go to society last I night. I did. Which yes. was was that nice for you? It was. It was nice to see everyone. Good. It's yeah, I always like society. It was sad because um when I was at GCB I like they kind of it was online for the last part of the year because of lockdown, so Okay. It was nice to see everyone in person, in the, in the flesh. Right. Yeah. And you didn't ever actually do GCBI class here in the office, right? Did you guys do class at the house the whole year? No, we did class in person for the first semester, and then we did it oh, at the house okay. for a little bit, okay. like when we came back, and then we came back to the office and we're, we're doing it in, in person. Okay, and, that's yeah. cool. So you still got that part of the like yes. classroom part of the experience instead of just being yeah. at the house the whole time. I couldn't remember what you guys did for that. Yeah, although being in the house was not the best. Well, it was nice because you could just wake up and like put on a pair of sweatpants and go downstairs for True. class. True, yeah. But um, yeah, it's nice to like get out of the house and everything. Yeah, I remember yeah. that from the end of my year, yeah. that it was nice, it definitely was nice to get to sleep in a little bit mm -hmm. later, but it also was much easier to get distracted because you're just kind of in your own house and then yeah. you want a snack, you go over to the cupboard, you want coffee, yeah. you go over and make coffee mm -hmm. in the middle of class mm -hmm. and you're just, you're just in your house. So wander just into of, the kitchen. Yeah, it feels different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's nice to have you back. It's, it's nice been, to be back. It's been an enjoyable week <laughs> enjoyable with you. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else? Um, next week we have another speaker in our Paul's Pro Tips series. Elder Barry is going to be speaking and he's going to be speaking on the pro tip, pace yourself. So make sure that you tune in and join with us for that. 
And next Sunday, we're also going to be partaking in bread and cup together. So make sure that you have your elements ready for that. Um, and is that it? I think that might be it. All right. Yeah. So thank cool. you for being here with us. Well, thanks uh, for again. having me. On, on the show, on the post show. On the show, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, we will, well, not we, because you won't be here next no, week. I'm going. But I will look forward to seeing all of you next week. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're not yeah. already. Give it a and like. And give, give this video a, <laughs> a like. like. Yeah. Yeah, Hit that's the right. notification bell. Oh, see, she can, yeah. do, the, she can do the whole outro. Yeah. Um, what about Facebook? What do they do on Facebook? Um, follow the Facebook? I think, do you, you, do you like Facebook pages? Do you like Facebook pages or do you follow them? I, I think know. you like them. You like them. Yeah. Like this video. Follow. Share it. Yeah, share, share the video on your social media. You can send out a tweet. A tweet? A tweet? I guess so. Is or Twitter still popular? I don't think so. Follow Church on Instagram. Follow us on Instagram, Renew Church go. CA. <laughs> and because we do post a lot of different stuff throughout the week and I think we started posting some clips from the sermons. Mm -hmm. So that has been pretty cool. A good reminder throughout the week of what was talked about on the previous Sunday. Yeah. So thank you for being with us and we will see you again next week. <laughs>